Hello everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Yashika, studying in 9th standard at St. Mary's High School. When I was in 6th grade, I got an opportunity to be a part of Dreamer Dreams after school life skills football programs. Uh, I got to know about myself that who I am and why I am. I am very glad to see him in Bangalore to attend CTS. They changed the script 2019. I was very much curious to share my views on him. He is a retired professor at Winchester University. He is also internationally renowned cognitive scientist. His building learning power approach to teaching is widely used in all kinds of schools across the UK and throughout the world. He always focuses on how to build more powerful learners, students who remain calm, confident, and curious as they face life challenges and pursue their passions. I asked a question to him, what is the leading cause of dropouts in schools today? According to him, he thinks that kids become impatient with education, family circumstances, family needs, through internet, social media, and even he thinks that because of phone, which is the part of the brain. He wrote a book called Intelligence in the Flesh. According to him, he thinks that physical health thinks better than the mental health. Our body knows what to do, like any emotions, anxious, etc. And even he thinks that if we do not listen to our body, then we are deaf. And when we relate their books to India, he thinks that the Indians are very cultural, are very calm, soft, open-minded, anxious, and the minds are clear. And he is none other than Guy Claxton. <laughs> So, I have uh, another question, sir, that is the one tip to stretch and develop in smart work way of study. Oh. <laughs> the, best way to, uh, the best way to study. Yeah. Well, two answers. Mm -hmm. The best thing to study is the thing you're passionate about. Because if you're passionate about it, then it's no effort. You just love. I'm passionate about education, and it's not work. It's just fun. It's just what I love to do. But if you have to do the stuff at school, if you're forced to study your textbook and do your work and so on, then there are lots of practical techniques that will make that kind of study more efficient, more reliable, enable you to get better marks. There is a a craft, there's a, a, a technology of being able to be successful at school in examinations. But it's nothing to do with intelligence. It's nothing to do with depth. It's nothing to do with passion. It's just a, like a learning, a learning a set of techniques. And if you're 14 years old, you just have to do it. Yes. I'm afraid right now we'll change the system but for you, Yashika, you just have to suck it up. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I have another one question. Oh, one more question. Yeah. So, as uh, modeling gives me confidence, and even when I play football, it gives me some more confidence. But when I, uh, like, read or when I enter to the education, like, why I don't get that confidence? <laughs> It's a really good question. It's like, you know, you should, you have it. It's in your body, it's in your being, that confidence. So there's no reason why you shouldn't. It's just another challenge, you know. For some students, it's a pretty meaningless, boring, old-fashioned, me meaningless challenge. But if it gets you the grades you want to get in order to get to the university you want to get to, you just got to do it. And if you learn the techniques, if you just treat it as a, a craft that you have to develop, then you'll be able to smash it. Yeah. 
Thank you. <laughs> Are we done? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you very much yeah. for the introduction. Yes. Stop on it. Stop on it. Stop on it. Wow. Great. Well, this is back to the life of the mind, somewhat. But I want to try and create a connection between the mood of the previous session, that wonderful uh, experiential learning that we were just involved in, that involved our emotions, our bodies, our tongues, our ability to connect with, to look at, to empathize with other human beings, all of that rich stuff, and to try and connect that with the more intellectual theme that also quite rightly runs through this, uh, this meeting, this conference. For me, I suppose the the general headline for me here, really strength, strongly reinforced by that session before, uh, before our tea break, is that there are many ways of knowing, many ways of being intelligent. And our education system, our global education system, has inherited an unbalanced obsession with just one or two of those ways of knowing. The rational, the mathematical, the explicit, the intentional, the deliberate. But we've just experienced that there are empathic ways of knowing, aesthetic ways of knowing, physiological ways of knowing, imaginative ways of knowing, physical ways of knowing, and it is and social ways of knowing. We've all, we discovered in those sessions, certainly in the group that I was part of, that the whole, the social whole was much greater than the sum of the parts. We became an intelligent, feeling, sensitive, wise unit for a period of time, the three of us together. Yet in our education system, we're often told to sit on our own, not talk to other people, put away your smartphone that connects you with this galaxy of information around you, to ignore your bodies, to sit still. At my school, they used to give us what psychologists call a paradoxical injunction. They would say to us, sit down. And then in the next moment, they would tell us, sit up. <laughs> Which do you want me to do? <laughs> Am I to sit down? Am I to sit up? But I'm to sit still, aren't I? The body is a nuisance. Emotions are subversive of rational thinking, rational understanding. So I would want to add to Rebecca's list of woes this morning the fact that we, our education system, to some extent is still stuck with a narrow understanding of the human mind, its relationship to the human body. We are both smaller and larger than that European westernized model of the mind would have us believe. If we are to understand truly our intelligence and what we are capable of being, how smart we are capable of being in the world, then we need to be in touch with, aware of, respectful of what's going on in our immune system, our digestive system, our circulatory system, our breathing, our muscles, our bones, our skeletons. If we are not inclusive of that wealth 
of relevant information, then we are less intelligent in the world than we could be. Yet education systematically, by neglect, trains us to treat the body only as either a nuisance when it gets sick or as a source of sporting trophies in the cabinet, in the, fo in the foyer, in the lobby of your school. In English schools, there's this prize cabinet on the wall with the cups, with the silverware, the trophies. And that's the only place where the body gets a good mention, or perhaps in the school orchestra, or in the school choir. But otherwise, it's as if the body had no, nothing to contribute, had no valid connection with the work, the life of the mind, with the intelligence of the whole apparatus. So we are both more minute than the westernized model of the mind, the intelligent mind, would have us believe. But we are also larger than that because we are connected through our magnetic fields, through our visual contact with other people, through our subliminal perception of the warmth or the movement of the bodies of the people that we are physically close to, through the images on our smartphones, through our texts, through our WhatsApps, we are not ourselves if we are disconnected from the social web that constitutes us. I am because I am you, is the full quotation, the phrase that we were using this morning. I am because I am you. I'm formed by your opinions. I'm changed by the look of distress or boredom or anger on your face. So to put me in an institution between the ages of 5 and 18, which requires me to function on my own, makes about as much sense as taking away David Beckham's football boots and telling him to show me how good a footballer he is. St stupid. Unnecessary. Corrupting of the way human beings function. So that's the headline. But I wanted to connect with just a quick little meditation, not singing, not dancing, not moving around, but just close your eyes for a moment and try and bring a little bit of that lovely mood that we've had in other sessions today. Close your eyes and try and sense as fully and as richly as you can how you feel, how you are in your body right now. Be aware of the effect of gravity, of the pressure on the soles of your feet, on the big muscles of your bottom, the pressure of your hands or your forearms lying on your thighs. Feel the way the earth is holding you up. Feel how essential, how constant that support is, that connectedness through gravity to the earth. What about that bony frame that holds us together, that gives us rigidity? What is your posture saying at the moment? Is your posture saying tired, alive, energetic, Restless, fidgety, connect in to what that, the shape of your body, what that is saying, what that's doing at the moment. What about your level of energy, the aliveness? How alive do you feel on a scale from one to ten? Where do you feel alive in your body? Where are you aware of movement? Tiny little movements, little tinglings, little twitches. Where can you feel that aliveness in your body?
What about those muscles, those big muscles in your body? Be aware of the muscles in your shoulders and your back, in your neck. See if you can feel the effort, the tension, the work those muscles are doing to hold up your head, to hold you still. Notice if there are any places in your body where those muscles are tense without needing to be. And notice when you notice that, for example, how your face is feeling. Is there any tension around your mouth, in your eyes, in your jaw, that is just there because you forgot to relax? And you might notice as you become aware of these small tensions, these little pockets of body armor, that they may heave a little sigh of relief and just soften a little bit, relax a little bit. What's going on in the big organs of your body? Can you feel the life in your stomach? Little gurglings, happy, relaxed, uneasy, queasy? Can you feel your heartbeat without putting your finger on a pulse? Are you aware of that constant motion inside you. What is your skin saying to you? Can you feel temperature? Can you feel moisture from sweat? Can you feel pressure on your skin? Can you feel changes in temperature? Can you feel any small breeze? any touch of the wind on your skin? Can you smell anything? What can you hear? What vision do you have behind those closed eyelids? What abstract play is going on on the inside of your eyelids? What desires, what concerns, what anxieties are there lurking around in your body? How much can you get in touch with that multitude, that teeming life that constitutes you, that underwrites all the life of the mind, of thinking, of writing, of analyzing, of talking. That background music, like the, the bass, the double bass in an orchestra. You often don't notice it, but there would be something missing if it wasn't there. What difference does it make if we bring that sensibility of our physicalness more into the margins, the edges of our awareness? Does that make a difference to how we behave, to how we think, to what decisions we make? And as you open your eyes, see if you can bring back with you just hold with you a little bit of that awareness or not even awareness, just that intimation, that feeling of the body without which there would be no mind. There would be no life of the mind if it wasn't underwritten moment by moment by the life of the body. People vary in how much and how accurately we are in touch with this internal life. Can you listen to the variability in your heartbeat? The healthy heart beats irregularly. 
Let me say that again. The healthy heart beats irregularly. Why? Because your heart is listening to what's going on in your stomach. It's listening to what's going on in your skin. And if it can't respond to what the brothers and sister organs in your body, what's going on in your mind, the thought, the fleeting thought that just flashed across your consciousness, if your heart can't respond, can't flex with what's going on in the rest of the system, it becomes unhealthy, it becomes disconnected from the rest of that complex unity that we are made up of. And people's sensitivity to that makes a difference. A very interesting paper was written, published about a couple of years ago that linked people's awareness of their own physiology. It's often indexed by how accurately people can count their heartbeats without putting their finger on their pulse. Just how sensitive are you? How aware are you of that? And what they found was that there was a, a strong correlation between people's sensitivity to, their, to the inner life of their body and how effective they were as being in their job as traders on the stock market. Making split-second decisions about whether to buy or sell currencies, international currencies. Very important momentary decisions on which would depend whether they were a million rupees up or a million rupees down. 10 million, 100 million rupees up or down. We would have thought that that was the life of the mind, that that was conscious, rational, explicit. Yet, in order to make good decisions, people who are more sensitive to the momentary state, the fluctuations of their inner bodily life, are more successful as money traders, and they have longer and more successful careers. Isn't that interesting? Did they teach you that at school? Are they teaching the, the importance? Do you have, does yoga have as much time on the curriculum as English or mathematics? Why not? If our intelligence depends upon it, and if we can get better at it, as we know we can, so these individual differences can be changed through participation, not necessarily in highly active sports, in competitive sports, but through more reflective, more meditative, learning to tune in, learning to listen to what's going on in your heart, in your, in your inner life. A man called George Soros is one of the most successful financiers on the planet, when he's making a decision of huge financial importance, he always listens to what's going on in his lower back. Not uncritically, he doesn't take that information as if it were the only information that mattered. But it's that voice of tension that may represent some little voice inside him saying, I'm not really comfortable with this, but it doesn't say it through the conscious mind. It says it through a little adjustment in physical tension here or there. So these things are very practical. We were listening to some very powerful stories of people's lives, the kinds of stories that people will tell when they're involved in counseling or therapy sessions. We know that one of the things that predicts how successful people would be if they're involved in counseling, involved in therapy, some very interesting research on this was done 40 or 50 years ago now, one of the predictors 
of whether people are finding that process useful, finding it therapeutic, enabling them to become reconciled to things that they feel angry about or guilty about in their past, and to be able to move on, to not be blocked in their lives. One of the things that predicts that is not the skill or the philosophical school of the counselor or the therapist, not even the personality of the therapist. It's whether the client, whether the person who's in the therapy room, whether they are talking in a way that is soft and hesitant, as if they were trying to give words to something that was holding the story, not at the level of words or sentences or propositions, but the truth of which was living in their body. It was as if the meaning of the story, the meaning of the predicament, the problem, was being held not by the vocabulary, but by something down here. And if they were, they were speaking, if they were able to speak as if they were listening to what was going on in their body, as if their body was the authority, they might say something like, well, when I'm with my mother, I don't know, how, it feels, It's almost as if I'm breathing on an oxygen tube and her hand is squeezing the tube. Almost as if I can hardly, I'm, I can hardly breathe. I'm struggling to breathe. Yeah, that's it. And what gives her that, what gives the daughter, the 43-year-old daughter, that sense of accuracy, this story is accurate, is the feeling in the body, is, a, is a, a felt sense of releasing. When you get the words exactly right, something in your body goes, ah, that's it. You heard me. Like a child, like a baby. And the mother is saying, what's the matter, sweetheart? Are you cold? Are you hungry? The child won't be, won't relax, won't rest until the cry is heard accurately. And some people are good and some people are not good at that patient listening, checking that the words that are coming out of their mouths are accurate, full representations of the story that is held in their body. It's as if when we speak, what lies behind the words is a slow process of unfurling of the meaning, as if the meaning begins with something much more bodily, much more visceral, like a little bubble at the bottom of a lake, set free from the mud at the bottom of the lake. And gradually, as it bubbles up, as it floats towards the surface, so it gets bigger, and it maybe begins to take a different shape or become more articulated, more precise, until when it breaks the surface, there's the thought, there's the language when it comes up. But often we don't notice it's like we live only on the surface of the lake. We only hear the words and we become blind to that process of welling up. I like that English expression, welling up. Many important things in our lives well up. You might have felt yourself welling up as I did as you were telling your story, as we were with you, moving, being moved by the preciousness of the biscuit and the slow nibbling of the biscuit 
my eyes began to prick with tears. I could feel it. I could feel the, the pressure of that story. But I could also feel that coming in my body. Like when you're, a sneeze is coming, or the urge to pee is coming, or an orgasm is coming, or a feeling of having a cold comes to us. So our thoughts and our insights come to us in that kind of way. Creative people listen to that welling up in the body. There's an English poet. He used to be the poet laureate in England, the, head, the most respected poet in England, a man called Andrew Motion. When he sits down to write a poem one morning, he'll often take a powder. In England, they're called, I don't know if they have them in, in India, called Beecham's powder. You have Beecham's powders? Yeah? It's like um, aspirin or paracetamol or something with some flavoring in. But you, you take one of these when you're having a cold. He doesn't have a cold, but he takes one of these powders as if he had a cold. And he finds that by doing that, he's able to trick his body into this more quiet, inward, slightly uneasy state. He persuades his body that it's feeling slightly ill as if something needs to be put right. And the creation of the poem is the way of putting right that feeling. So the life of the mind is conditioned by the state of the body. So creativity, trading on Wall Street or the stock market, our ability to heal ourselves of problems and disappointments of adversity and hardship. These three very different forms of human intelligence, of human flourishing, all essentially rely on what's going on in our bodies and on our openness, our willingness, our softness, our ability to feel the resonance. Like when you're playing a guitar or a sitar, you have to get the tension of the string just right. Too tight and you don't get the music. It doesn't vibrate in the right way. Too loose and it doesn't vibrate. So we need to have a certain softness in our bodies. Yet, as a lot of us grow up, we grow up with an accumulation of physical tensions. Sometimes we even forget when we're asleep to relax, to reset our musculature. We grow up with what Willem Reich, a famous psychologist, called body armor, until we get to the point where we have chronic backache or chronic digestive disorders, because our body has forgotten how to relax itself. We're constantly tired because we're exerting this effort to armor ourselves against the resonance of the body, against the flow of feelings. We harden ourselves. And in doing that, we harden ourselves to other people. Because our empathy, we feel empathy, we connect with other people by literally, physically, our bodies resonate with what we imagine is going on with someone else. I can only feel your, what's going on in you, I look at your facial expression and tiny little muscular movements inside my own face begin to mimic that expression. I may not be aware of it, but it's through recreating in my own physiology what I think I've seen in your face that I am able at least to believe that I can feel what it's like to be you, that I can have that human feeling. Yet if we go hard, if we armor ourselves against our emotionality, if we're taught that our anger is wrong, that our sadness is wrong, that big boys don't cry, if we grow up with those beliefs, we lose intelligence. 
We lose social intelligence. We lose emotional intelligence. Traditional wisdom knows this. The poets know this. For goodness sake, we're in a school of ancient wisdom. What, a what wisdom could be more ancient than the wisdom of the body? As you look around in this place, you'll see imageries, imagery, quotations of these things. And yet, for some reason, there's been an epidemic across the world of this narrow, shrunken, intellectualized model of the human mind, which has corrupted education and corrupted millions of young people. It has taught young people who are good with their bodies, good with their hands, good with engines, good with animals, good with plants, that somehow their intelligence is second rate, good with food, good with caring for old people, that that's not as good as being good with language, good with essays, good with mathematics, good with science. And if we're going to try and help youngsters from all different backgrounds to be able to fulfill their potential, to be able not to succumb to the pressures of adversity, not to harden, not to allow their bodies to retain that armor that they needed when they were small. If you're in a family that is hungry or violent or unstable or insecure, you may have needed your armor then. But that armor which was once your friend now becomes your shell that stops you growing. So we need to cast off the shells. We need to soften the shells. As a hermit crab outgrows the shell and needs to go through that period of vulnerability while it looks for another shell, while it finds another space to be. I was just going to read you. I've nearly time for us to have some questions. I was reading an academic paper the other day. It's called Psychobiology and the Molecular Genetics of Resilience. How grown up is that? <laughs> Psychobiology and the Molecular Genetics of Resilience. Just a couple of quotations. Identifying the psychosocial determinants of stress resistance. People who are able to recover from stress, to overcome stress. What are these? What does, the, what does the research tell us? Positive emotions, the capability for self-regulation, social competence with peers, a close bond with a primary caregiver, dispositional optimism, openness to social support, greater flexibility of thinking and exploration, a broadened focus of attention, and decreased autonomic activity. That's to say, the, the, the part of the nervous system that, that we use when we go into fight or flight, when we harden up, when we become scared or angry. If we get stuck with that, then those emergency measures become things that block us up and stop us being the creative, vibrant people that we can be. The main reason, I think, why Rebecca asked us what's the purpose of education this morning. Here's my answer. The purpose of education is to produce a generation of young people who will save us from ourselves the rest of us. And I wanted just to show you a little short film clip. You may have seen this already, of a 15-year-old girl two or three weeks ago talking to the rich and famous of the planet at a place called Davos about how they need to wake up, how young people 
need to become the voice of our conscience, need to have that vision, moral courage, and deep intelligence to face the critical problems that the world is facing. We are now at a time in history where everyone with any insight of the climate crisis that threatens our civilization and the entire biosphere must speak out in clear language, no matter how uncomfortable and unprofitable that may be. We must change almost everything in our current societies. The bigger your carbon footprint is, the bigger your moral duty. The bigger your platform, the bigger your responsibility. Adults keep saying, we owe it to the young people to give them hope. But I don't want your hope. I don't want you to be hopeful. I want you to panic. I want you to feel the fear I feel every day. And then I want you to act. I want you to act as if you would in a crisis. I want you to act as if the house was on fire. Because it is. Yes! <laughs> that could be Ashika. That could be any one of you. Yeah? Whatever. Whatever your circumstances, whatever your background. And I don't think politicians are going to be brave enough or smart enough or energetic enough to do what needs to be done, not only about the global crisis, but about the whole, all the little things in your communities or whatever. People who have the energy, the vision, the passion, the clarity to cut through the bullshit and the excuses, to feel that the house is on fire, and to help us do what needs to be done. Maybe even particularly young people who haven't come from privileged backgrounds, who've experienced hardship, people who've built their resilience, who've learned to feel, who've learned to have the courage, the confidence to deal with these things. Maybe you especially. Thank you. Question time. Th thank you, Guy. That was inspiring and very beautiful. Sorry. Oh, there you are. Hi. Um, but I was wondering if you could um, bring it down um, a moment and connect it to Yashaka's question. What, what does this new way of thinking about our bodies and being more um, broad in terms of our ways of knowing, how could that help Yashika's study? How could that help? What, yeah, what are your strategies? You mentioned there's you know, a well, couple strategies. What I've are they exactly? I've been instructed by Vishal that I'm not to mention the strategies because that's for tomorrow. <laughs> 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 so I was listening to Vishal's body. It's a nice body, I like it. Uh, we need more yoga in schools, or Tai Chi, or meditation. Time to be quiet, time to be calm. We need to connect young people to the center of their sense of what's right and what's wrong, that visceral sense. Antonio Damasio, who's one of the leaders of this field, talks about, I like his image, he talks about the importance of the visceral rudder. You know the little thing at the back of the boat that steers the boat under the water? The rudder, that's our visceral rudder. And if we're disconnected from that, he's done lots of research on people with brain damage. There's a particular form of brain damage that disconnects 
your rational intelligence from the visceral rudder. People can have still retain very high IQ. They just behave stupidly in their lives. When, that, when they're disconnected, the rudder doesn't give us that sense of, people talk about the moral compass, that direction to go. So we need to give young people more opportunities to value and listen, to be directed by their moral compass, which means a form of education that is very familiar to all of us, that is built around, uh, I had a string of words here, expli forms of activity in school which are explicit, engaging, no, that's the wrong list. Wait a minute. Let me, let, me, <laughs> let me find the right list. Engaging, challenging, student-led, collaborative, focused, and productive. That's to say the outcome is something that actually matters to someone in the world, that actually helps to solve a problem. If we could design a curriculum that honored and respected that physiological driver of learning, that put that passions, put those passions at the center of what young people were learning. If you were doing things that really fired you up, like that girl in Davos, you wouldn't need to be motivated. You wouldn't need teachers to make things interesting for you. You would be irresistible, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? So there's a, there's a whole range of things. I think just talking to you, what could be more interesting than this stuff about understanding what goes on in you? When Yashika and I were talking earlier on today, I said to her, what would you like to know? She said, like, what is it like to be me? You know? It's like nothing is more important than to understand mind and body and to have an accurate understanding of it. But there are lots of other things. I won't give you any more because I'm not supposed to but I have my program. Uh, hi. My question is, um, and it's obviously uh, part of what I do in life is, is climate change is something that's very passionate to me. Um, I think that the whole principle today, if the premise of education, I, I, I honestly believe that part of the problem uh, that we have today is on account of two things, the failure of the education system. I'm terribly sorry. Do you, could you speak a little more sorry. slowly and a little yeah, more yeah, yeah. loudly? I'm having trouble sure, sure, sure. following Sure, sure, sure. So, I, so I, I was saying I believe that the education system fundamentally today is flawed simply because it prepares people uh, for a construct that clearly we know is not working today, whether it's yes. climate change or any of the other problems. We, the single greatest sort of, of problem with mankind today is the fact that we don't believe that we're one with a larger ecosystem. We, we're so individual about the way that we are. We yes. believe that we're the whole and soul of, of the way yes. that the world works. Uh, the whole connectivity between us and an ecosystem that is beyond us, whether that's people yeah. around us, whether that's the environment. Yes. Now, that's not something that we've ever attempted to teach yeah, the children through school. The physical ecosystem and the social ecosystem as well. Right. Um, and therefore, the construct of this education system as it exists today essentially is getting children to be prepared for a world that is largely consumer-based, capitalistic, whatever you may want yeah. to call it. Yeah. Uh, now, if that is the driver, if that's the motivation, and even with leapfrogging and all of the other things that we're saying, if everything we're trying today is essentially to get children to, to be part of that construct and essentially crack that system that we know has failed, yes. I really sort of struggle to understand what, what it is that, that, that we're really trying to do with, with this continued sort of, 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 of traction around let's, let's get everyone to this. We know that, that, that getting us to that point is not helping anybody. Yes. Why are we constantly pushing that? Why aren't we doing what you're suggesting, which is to try and look at education more holistically, yeah. especially with the children, because the system lets them down. Even if you taught them all of this in school and, and yoga and all of these things and they came into the real world, and the real world doesn't appreciate what they bring into it. Yes. There's no way they're going to sort of continue. They're going to become adults like, like all of us and continue to sort of live that. So uh, I, I actually sort of find it quite frustrating to imagine that we're still working on an education system that's essentially pushing children to the same tipping point that we know doesn't work today. Yes. And that's, that's at least my personal frustration with, with, with a lot of the way that, that, that this system is working. So I completely sort of believe in what you're saying. I think that it's very important today more than ever that we learn to live, uh, learn, learn to teach children that they 
they, they're part of a larger sort of construct. And there is a way to navigate that world as long as, as people sort of appreciate many of the things that you're saying. Yes. Uh, it it yes. was a comment, sorry, it, yeah, it yeah, wasn't actually. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I think that's, that's the, that the biggest leapfrog is to say that tink tinkering with something that is so out of date, intellectually out of date, socially out of date, ecologically out of date, we're going to end up being further, than, it's not going to be a hundred year gap, it's going to be a millennial gap if we carry on at that speed. And I agree, you know, we won't, until we realize that it's not just the planet that's on fire, it's education that is on fire. You know, we should be panicking about education. I agree. Yeah. Fiona. Thank you so much. That was really great. It was a sad way to stop. Um, I, I want to share something uh, respectfully. Uh, an, observation, an observation about Indian culture. Please correct me if I'm incorrect. Uh, I was speaking to an Indian friend about a conservatory we built. And we painted it white, this, this conservatory. And my Indian friend said, but, but why did you not just leave it wood? It would have been so much better that way. And uh, my experience of India is that it, it's uh, a good thing always to correct someone, to give them advice about how to do it better, and to point out what they've done wrong. So a lot of education... That's, you're talking about my wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's not just in India, guys. <laughs> but I have noticed that uh, a lot of uh, parents interacting with children, teachers interacting with children, feel it their duty to point out what the young person has done wrong, as opposed to what the wrong young person has done right. And so if you're constantly being told what you have got wrong, then it will affect your confidence. It will take the joy and passion out of the classroom. So even just that unconditional positive reinforcement, so having space to make errors, to be free to follow your gut and do what is meaningful to you, yeah. if you can bring that into the classroom and the whole of society, not just Indian society, but yeah, it's yeah. a very big, big shift to ask people. Yeah, and cultures vary in where the cultural blockers are. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, there are some cultures in which you know, the idea of making a mistake is not just something which causes you personally to lose face, but it brings shame on the family. It's like, how messed up is that? Like, that, that belief just disables learning, doesn't it? You know, learning is experimenting. Learning is imagining. Learning is getting things wrong. Learning is trying something that didn't work very well and trying to get it to do it better. That's what learning is. But if you're surrounded by a culture that says you shouldn't have made your mistake or why did you not get an A or that kind of atmosphere, this is a culture that is oppressing children. It's oppressing learning. It's oppressing creativity. And then some of those cultures will say we need a creative economy. We need to promote the creative industries. But they persist with an education system that, is, that suppresses creativity because creativity is the child of error. It's the child of mistakes. The house is on fire. Yeah. Um, you know, in terms of, uh, I think also responding to you, and you said that the education system is out of date. Yes. I think yes and no, that um, actually it's in sync with what else is, everything else that's happening, right? So in that sense, it's up to date. But in terms of, uh, I mean, I'll think of Krishnamurti. In right? terms of Krishnamurti, Rabindranath Tagore, and uh, you know all the greats, the Indian greats that have been, um, their whole thing was that the goal of education is to help us find out who am I and how am I related to the universe and others in it. And they followed these systems which were very holistic and, uh, and very much paying attention, very close attention to what's going on inside your body, outside it, yeah. even to a fly, even to fear, to your emotions. And people accuse them, especially I know with Krishnamurti schools. Well, oh, these are very soft schools and they're out of, out of touch with reality and the children will be misfits. Right. right. And they have many, right. many schools right. in all over India. They're out of and, touch with yeah. manic consumerist Correct. reality. But what happened was that I know many people from Krishnamurti, from Rishi Valley, and there might be many here, 
that, yeah, they were misfits, and I think that was the good thing. Yeah. That, that was the purpose, to make them misfits in a society that is manic. And they did change the system in whatever they, way they could. They did change the narrative, they did change the script, you know. So in terms of being out of date, I think it's, uh, there is much else that's going around that could be changed, right? And I don't know that it's out of date, because there have been many ancients, the school of ancient wisdom, the whole Vedanta school, Socrates, know thyself, and everywhere. There was all these old, this is very ancient, all this stuff. So it's not out of date. In fact, Nitish was saying that why aren't we going back to the old systems? It's just been moving along with what the ecosystem, the social, the economic, the political ecosystem. Sure. And that's how it's emerged. Yes. So. But I think we, we have to finish in a second. But I'd just li like to finish by just talking about, I mean, you can't be intelligent if you have misrepresented to yourself the nature of the predicament that faces you, if you're not in touch with the full, complicated, inconvenient, multi-layered, messy reality of what that predicament it is, whatever you're going to do to try and make it better is going to be ineffective or mischievous. If you have shrunk that predicament, in terms of its internal description. In other words, being present to the external reality and the internal reality simultaneously is a precondition for coming up with any kind of a fix that is going to be effective. And what Krishnamurti and Sri Aurobindo and whoever else you might care to mention you know, I mean, a big part of that is not just about nirvana or atman or all that kind of stuff. It's about being present to what needs to be done and what possibly can be done right here and right now. And I just, the thing I just want to leave you with is like a famous, my, I had an Indian teacher when I first came to India about uh, 40 years ago. <clears throat> first time I came here to spend time with the man who was going to be my master, my teacher for the next seven years. And in one of his lectures, he talked about this. He talked about how what sometimes happens is when you go for an interview and you're in the interview room and before you go, you've prepared answers to all, all the questions they think is gonna, uh, that you're going to be asked. And then you're in the interview room and they ask you something completely different. And you say this or you say that. And then when you come out of the interview room and you're walking down the staircase, you have to be walking down a staircase because the French call this phenomenon l'esprit d'escalier. It's like suddenly when you're outside the interview, your mind is going, oh, I should have said this. I should have said that. Why do not other? And Bhagwan said, before you are wise, afterwards you are wise. Unfortunately, in the middle, you are otherwise. <laughs> and there was a laugh and a pause. And then he said, and in the middle is life. That's where life shows up, in the middle. And yet we have an education that almost encourages people to be otherwise, to become ready-made, to feel that you have to come to life ready-made with your set of answers to something or other, rather than allowing yourself to be soft and naked and present and intelligent with what needs to be done. <laughs>